Did you inherit $1 million from your grandparent? Or are you about to become wealthy from someone else's hard work? If you say yes to these questions, this show is not for you. You, the hardworking, committed, and ambitious professional who have a 9-to-5 corporate job or a 12-hour shift worker keeping the assembly line running. Perhaps you run your gig as a freelancer or maybe you run a small business. You are in the right place. Welcome to the Career Evangelist Podcast, where you get your weekly tips, ideas, strategies, and inspiration to find purpose in what you do so you can build a career you are passionate about and live a fulfilled life. Here is your host, Bola Alabi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Career Evangelist Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us. We have Dr. Kuretz, a highly respected therapist and the founder of Azimuth, which is a practice that specializes in addressing the mental health challenges faced by individuals, especially in high pressure career. With over a decade of experience, Dr. Kuretz has worked extensively with professionals in the field like law, consulting, finance, and tech. He has helped, she has helped people navigate career burnout, identity enmeshment, and the stress that comes with demanding roles. Her expertise has been featured in major publications like Harvard Business Review and Wall Street Journal. Guys, you are going to benefit from today's episode because we are going to be discussing burnout, career identity, and how to bounce back from any setback in your career. Without any further ado, I'll bring in our guest, Dr. Correct. Hey, Dr. Correct, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about these things. Awesome. Welcome to the show. We are glad you are here with us. So you talk a lot about managing stress, managing uh, burnout. Can you share some practical tips for my listeners on how to manage stress in demanding work environments? Absolutely. And this is something we talk all the time about with our clients, of course. Um, And one tip that we typically start with with people um, is really taking small steps. I know that everyone loves to do the 180 or do like sign up for a marathon or, you know, do that kind of thing. And that's great. But in reality, what helps over time is the little things that build up together. And so it feels very boring. It feels very not very exciting. But, you know, instead of signing, you know, wanting, let's say you want to incorporate fitness back into your life, because that's really helpful for stress reduction uh, for you. Instead of saying, I'm going to go to the gym every day at five o'clock in the morning before work, uh, and I'm going to do an hour on the treadmill or what have you, you know, just try to move your body in some fashion, you know, for some amount of time, three times a week, and just see how it goes. See what you like doing, see what's sustainable, because the problem with big changes is they don't tend to be sustainable. And I think the nice thing about small changes that they a are sustainable they b also build on themselves and they really help shift your mindset into oh i can do things differently oh i i am able to do that you know and taking more control over a situation where you feel very out of control and so that's one that we usually start with is just baby steps (laughs) you know as boring as that sounds yeah it's it may sound simplistic but i think that's the best way to handle Maybe almost any uh, challenges, start small, build on it, and see how you make progress. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I know you develop uh, tools like the burnout calculator and uh, career enmeshment test. Can you share the impacts these tools have had on some of the users based on the feedback that you are getting from them? Yeah, I mean, we have the, those two, and then we have a third one called the Values Navigator, which is about personal values. Um, and I think people really love to kind of see where they're at and have somebody or something else to confirm what they already know. So a lot of our clients will say, I took the burnout calculator test, and I was really, really high, and I, I sort of already knew that, but it was really helpful to confirm that that 
I really felt seen. The question seemed so relevant to me and I felt more able to do something about it because I had somebody sort of confirm these worries that I wasn't sure if I was, you know, did I make it up? Is this just how people live? You know, it's kind of hard to know, especially when you're burnt out. Um, to have the mental energy to kind of sort all of that out is really hard. So I think just having an external tool to help sort of ground people and um, orient them to what they're looking at and what they like to change um, has been very helpful. At least that's the feedback we've gotten. Um, and then in regards to the values navigator separately, that one has been actually our most used tool out of the three, um, because I think a lot of people don't well, they haven't had the time or the luxury of knowing that personal values are really important. Like that's very basic. And I think people, when you hear that, you would say, of course, of course they're important, but people don't tend to really think about what that means to them. And they don't tend to think about how that, how, what they're doing in their life professionally or otherwise fits in line with their personal values. And so they feel very uncomfortable. They might be really stressed out. They might not like their job anymore and not really know why. And a lot of that has to do with personal values. Like what is actually important to you? Um, and even if you have thought about it, you know, it does change over time. You get older, things have life experiences that change your perspective. And so to really sit down and say, what is important to me and have that tool be an anchor point, um, to just start the conversation has been helpful for people, but we have like, thousands and thousands of people coming a day to that, to that tool, especially. Oh, that's good. So, uh, you talk about this tool, uh, how can people assess the tool? Is it a web portal or where do people need to go in order to gain mm -hmm. access to this tool? Yeah, they're all free. They're on our website. So they're just azimuthpsych.com. Um, you'll see it says free resources in the top. It's one of the bars and those three pop down. So you can just get on there and see, um, you know, which one resonates with you. You can take the, the test. And actually the values navigator is based on Shalom Schwartz's work, his research, and we're turning it into an app, which should be out next uh, early next year about um, just how it, it's a journaling app. So kind of figuring out how you can maintain living in alignment with your personal values over time um, because it has been so popular and we feel pretty strongly about values, which is feels a little tangential to work and work stress and things like that, but really they, they're very interconnected. So what you are saying is that uh, when people get on your website, if they go on the, to the tool, uh, they will go to values navigator uh i guess after i'm guessing they'll out to they will have to fill out some information about them and it will spew out their values right is that the uh is that how it works or can you tell us more yeah yeah so for his work um he has his own categories of values and yeah we'll kind of spit out your values and kind of tell you what based on the questions where you might fit in um to you know, the, what were your top three? And so those get emailed to you. And then the next step, if you wanted to do it, would be in, to put it into the app and then you can rate your journal entries. And there are prompts that other clinicians and I have written that help people that kind of generate into the app too, to kind of help you start thinking about what are my values? How am I going to live in alignment with them? What is working? What isn't working? And all of that. So I guess, why is it important for people to know their personal values? Well, because a lot of times we deep down, we they're, they're part of us, right? We know they're part of who we are. And when we're kind of going about the, our day to day, we do a lot of things for external reasons. You know, we need to get jobs so we can make money. Um, you know, we need to, uh, you know, drive to work because we can't walk there. You know, there's just a lot of re ways that the world works where we do things on autopilot and we don't really think about what we're doing. And then over time that tends to not work for people. And especially like if we take it in from a professional context, for example, um, you know, people will often really reach for a career. Like let's just take law as an example, right? And so they've been, for whatever re reason, internal, external forces, family of origin, whatever it is, they've been told like, you know, you really need to go to a good college. You need to get an advanced degree. You need to go to law school. This is kind of what we're doing in our family. So this person goes along, checks all the boxes, goes, goes, you know, gets into the good school, gets into a good law school, passes the bar, goes to the firm, makes partner, whatever, and kind of arrives in whatever that means. Uh, and they're not happy because really deep down inside, the work they're doing is not in alignment with their personal values. And it's confusing and upsetting for people because they put all this time and effort into 
getting to where they've been, they are, and they're not happy in the way that they thought they would be. And so people really struggle with that. And you can have a lot of mental health symptoms that develop from that and substance abuse and things like that. But um, people don't really know that that often has to do with a misalignment with their personal values. And once they start reflecting on that, they start to see the inconsistencies and that really helps them make change or think about how they might might make change in the future, even if they're not able to now. You know, the point is not quit your job and move somewhere and start an ice cream shop. I mean, you could do that, but the idea is thinking about if that is actually your goal, right? So how are you going to get there? Because you can't, most of us, right? We can't just quit our jobs and yeah. move to California or whatever. So um, that's how they're kind of related. Okay, so you use the word career enmeshment when we started our conversation um if you don't mind can you explain the concept of this uh enmeshment and how it impacts uh mental health sure so career enmeshment is when someone's whole identity gets wrapped up in their job wow. and it's so all everything they know about themselves or things that they talk about themselves like their whole identity becomes their job and usually that's because people are in high pressure careers or other reasons they're at work a lot and they're working all the time. And obviously the more you work, the less you're doing other things. Um, and so typically when we see people, it's when um, that has been true for them. They haven't really known that. And then their company gets acquired, let's say, and they lose their job or they miss a promotion or something happens to them where part of their job is taken and they fall apart because now they don't know who they are. They don't know what they're supposed to do with their time. They don't know anything about themselves. It sort of promotes this very big existential crisis, which results in things like a lot of anxiety, depression, social anxiety, um, relationship troubles, you know, things like that. Some, a lot of times substance use that wouldn't, they wouldn't already be doing. So um, it can really take a toll because all of their identity sort of in one basket. And then the basket breaks, the eggs fall out, and there's nothing left. So what do you tell people that maybe are dealing with this career enmeshment that that's people that see all their values tied to their job? What do you tell them uh, to do in order to balance it and, you know, discover some other aspect of their life that also, I'll say, is cru uh, crucial to them uh, or to their person? Yeah. Well, we have to kind of start with helping people build other parts of themselves. And a lot of times people already have a lot of their own, you know, they have, people are people, they're dimensional, they have a lot going on, they have a lot as part of their identity, but they can't access it because they're stuck in this other part of themselves, or they haven't been able to access it in a long time because they haven't sort of done anything else, if you will. So for example, um, one of the ways in which we tell people to work, one of the ways in which uh, you can help if you have yourself if you have career measurement uh, is to kind of rekindle your personal network. We talk a lot about professional networks all the time, but personal networks are people, you know, first of all, a lot of the people we know in our practice who suffer for, from career measurement have not seen their friends of any kind for like very often for a long time. And so not only your recent, more recent friends, but also friends from before, because you, everyone has stages in their life and seasons where they might be doing different things or they're different ages and stuff like that. So by, you know, re calling up your best friend from high school that you haven't talked to in a really long time, you know, is really, that relationship is really different than a friend you might have now. And that person knew you, has known you a long time and might remember things about you or elicit parts of you that you haven't had in a while. Like, oh, I was funny. I am a funny person, you know, and talking to this old friend reminds me of that. Or, oh yeah, I did used to volunteer at the soup kitchen. And I really did like that. That was really fun. I wonder if I can do that again. So really going back in time, I think, and sort of wondering which friends or which acquaintances uh, you can touch base with and just kind of reestablishing that because not only will it do that, kind of remind you of all the things that you once were or could be or might like still um the just the connectedness is really helpful for people you know i think a lot of times when people go through a transition they feel very alone and they feel like people don't understand them and that it's only them and by having more connections sure you can talk about your own issues with other people but it's also nice to t not do that and to use friends and acquaintances to get outside yourself and you know do other activities and uh, hear about their lives and things that are hard for them. 
um, because that can also help with perspective taking and kind of pulling yourself out of a difficult situation. Well, that, that is good. Perspective taking. I like that. Now, I want to understand your inspiration for starting your uh, business and uh, especially why are you focusing on high pressure careers? Sure. Well, it sort of happened organically, I'll say. So when we first opened, when I first opened the practice, we were, you know, we're Boston based. So we were seeing more of like a general practice. But as we became, you know, over time, we realized more and more of what we were doing, probably in part because of where we are, um, was sort of helping people in high pressure careers. And we were learning a lot about the nuances of these different domains. And Sure, you know, we do see people in finance and law and consulting and stuff like that, but um, high pressure careers are really self identified. So people come from all over, all different kinds of jobs, you know, all different kinds of things. Um, and we really found that's what we were doing. And so we thought, well, there's obviously a need for this. And not a lot of people are focusing, at least psychologists, right, are not focusing on using their clinical knowledge in this way to help this group of folks. So we should probably do that because it seems like it's really important. And it turns out it was. All right, that's good. So mm -hmm. you've talked about high pressure career. Uh, maybe there's someone out there, uh, they may be dealing with all these demand on them, but they are yet to recognize that they are mm -hmm. in this high pressure career. What can you tell them? Uh, in terms of managing their burnout, well, how can they deal with that? Well, I think on some level, most people know that they're uncomfortable in some way, right? They might not know why, they might not, can't really identify it. It's not, we hear a lot of, well, it's not really anxiety. I'm not really depressed. I just feel really uncomfortable, like a little bit apathetic, you know, but there's something there that's uncomfortable that you sort of wish might not be there. And so taking a look at that and kind of thinking about, well, what could that be about? You know, what are things that might be, I might like to be different. And there are a couple exercises you can do to, to figure that out. Uh, one I like is pretty straightforward, but um, if you didn't have, we asked the question, if, if you didn't have any constraints on time, money, whatever, if your life could look however you wanted it to look, like what would it actually look like? And most of the time people are not saying Oh, I live in like a big house on an island. You know, that's not what they say. Um, what what people really think about it, they come up with all sorts of things that are very creative and very specific to them. And then you're like, oh, I realize that if that's my ideal, how far am I from that? Because we all have constraints, right? We all can't do exactly what we want, but um, we could do something in the ballpark, maybe. And um, people tend to realize that they're pretty far away from that. So that's that's one thing we like to do. Um, Another thing I like to ask people is, who do you admire? Because a lot of times, you know, when you talk about people you admire or that you almost want to be like, we talk about why is that? What what qualities or characteristics do they exemplify that are important to you that really stand out to you that you really like? And by doing that, too, you can kind of start to see like, oh, I, I actually really think that, you know, community service is important because the, per the people that I admire do a lot of work within the community or something like that. And then that helps us start the conversation of, okay, so how are we going to incorporate that more into your life now? And also in the future, if we're going to move the needle into that a little bit more. Um, so we do like to do sort of exercises like that. Oh, okay. That is good. So uh, I like uh, the way you framed that question about uh, people taking their time to think about their ideal life, you know, uh, what would they be doing? And I think most people, uh, we, we don't spend enough time to think about that ideal scenario. And because of that, we uh, most of we just run uh, through the, our day without really knowing exactly what we want. So thank you for uh, talking about that and for promoting mental wellness, uh, I, which I think it, uh very important. Now, I, I this is the Career Evangelist podcast, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I try I, I, to connect people with their career. I encourage people to find what they uh, love to do so that they can mm -hmm. stay happy doing that. Uh, I want you to walk us through your career. How did you get to this point today? What, how, where did you start from? What have you done? Can you share some of those uh, background with us. Oh, yeah. Myself. You want me to talk about myself? Okay. Um, 
I don't know how far you want me to go back, but um, let's see. Um, Maybe the past five years. Let's talk okay. about Okay. Okay. Uh, that's helpful. So um, let's see. Well, the last five years is about the time that we've, well, I guess last seven or so, we've been really focusing on the high pressure careers, partly for the reasons that I stated before, but also just noticing like colleagues or friends or acquaintances, just seeing what the culture, the work culture that we live in now in general is terrible. You know, um, no one takes real vacation. No one's encouraged to take real vacation. Um, people are expected to be at their, you know, at their desk, computer, wherever, all the time. Um, people expect emails to be read at 11 and answered. You know, if there's no line anymore between work and home. And I, I think COVID made that a lot worse, um, yeah. right? Because then there's there's no line for anything. Uh, and coming back from that, especially working from home, I think there's a lot of advantages to that, uh, disadvantages as well. Um, but we still haven't really established those boundaries back and they were bad to begin with. So, you know, just seeing that happen around me all the time also made me really think about how important this was and kind of started my personal crusade, not against our work culture per se, but certainly pushing to change and pushing to help people who are stuck in this, you know, expectations of our society and their jobs. And, um, you know, I think because the society allows for burnout and workaholism and all that, companies take advantage of that. And so then you have a whole group of people who are, you know, unwell and really stressed out because of that. So um, I think it happened organically, but then I really put a lot of effort into making that happen because I was seeing, I really opened my eyes and was looking around and seeing all of this, you know, even reflecting back to graduate school, you know, that was not a great time <laughs> for me and anyone, right? It's, it was the things that we were asked to do at practicum and the amount of time, it just like, wasn't really a reasonable lifestyle. Um, for anybody. So I think that that really helped me focus in and really start reaching out to people um, to like hiring more and trying to build our practice so we could help more people and, you know, going on podcasts or writing articles just so people could under could get the word out and understand that this is something that is happening. And, you know, we can help you. Um, so I think in the last five years, that's been mostly our focus. Um, you know, COVID was an interesting time. So we were actually very, very busy during COVID. Um, we were busy now, but it was unbelievable um, because I think people had this high pressure career anyway, but they always had another place to go. Maybe they had the gym or they weren't at home and they came, you know, but now they have, there's nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I, I I think what you what you mentioned about uh, vacation and the work culture here in the U.S. is spot on. Uh, I have some uh, colleagues uh, in Europe. When they are forced, they are mandated to take their vacation. So that's one. And whenever they are on vacation, they are practically off the grid. They they are not responding. Mm -hmm email they are just enjoying their personal time and i think that's a something that we need to adopt in this country so that when you're on vacation you are you are you taking time off work and you are mm -hmm. getting yourself involved in some other things some hopefully something that you enjoy so thank you for sharing that now uh, dr correct we are going to go into what i call our rapid fire uh, questions oh boy okay so what's your favorite favorite way to distress after a long day? I like personally, I like to exercise Sorry. because it helps me be more mindful because I can't really think of anything else because I'm not that in shape. So it's very hard for me. <laughs> uh, so I, it helps me really focus out, pulls me out of whatever is happening in my life. And then I have a little more space when I return to okay. function well, I guess. <laughs> Exercise for mindfulness. I like that. Yes. So yes. What's the most, in, most common career related issue that you see in your clients? maybe the major thing they are dealing with? 
I think we would be burnout and values misalignment for sure. Yeah. If you weren't a therapist, what career would you choose? Oh, I think I'd be a physician. Physician, I like that. Mm -hmm. What's the best career advice you've ever received? Oh, I got to think about that one. Um, I think the best advice I've ever received um, came from like an older colleague of mine who said, you don't, you know, she, what did she say? She said, you have to follow the rules, but then you can make new ones. And I was like, interesting. Okay. So, you know, you got to play the game and be part of society and all that and whatever the rules are, but then you can be part of a career and then change, make change basically. Right. Uh, and I like that a lot. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So give us one word to describe the culture at Azimuth. Warm. Warm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's warm. Warm. Warm is good. If finally, if you could mm -hmm. give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Stay scrappy. Stay scrappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I like that. So finally, uh, Dr. Corrette, uh, where can my listeners find you? Yeah, so um, all, everything, we put everything on our website, which is azimuthpsych.com, which is a very hard name to, to pronounce. I, in retrospect, it was not the greatest name for a business, but um, A-Z-I-M-U-T-H, psych.com. Uh, so everything's there. It's pretty clear. We try to, you know, not clutter the website with too much information. So you should be able to find exactly what you need. Um, all of the tools are there. Any media we've been in, you can take a look at our clinicians, including our therapy dog, Opie. Uh, so everything is, should be right there. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate your time and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You as well. All right.